take a few seconds. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? And I, I, uh, tell me in the chat if, if, uh, if this connection's working here. All right, excellent. Okay, now I'm seeing it. Seems like there might be a, a little bit of a calm delay. Um, all right, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. I hope everybody had an incredible convention uh, over the past few days. Uh, my name is Jeff Nunn. I am the uh, adjunct curator for space history at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. And uh, this evening, I'm going to be uh, capping off Narcon by uh, giving you all a, a virtual tour of uh, one of our uh, two main space galleries. So the, the gallery we're going to go through uh, is our Apollo exhibit. And that covers uh, the beginnings of, of modern rocketry up through uh, the post-Apollo 1970s. And so uh, we are going to uh, walk through the exhibit using a, a special 3D scan that uh, our team uh, constructed uh, of the gallery. Uh, and we, we can chat about uh, the artifacts, space stories, etc. cetera. So uh, a little background on me. I am the Museum of Flight's main uh, space expert. I was the lead developer on this gallery. And uh, I also volunteer with NASA's Solar System Ambassadors. And I, I suspect that there are probably some folks at NARCON uh, who are Solar System Ambassadors. But for those of you who are not familiar, it is... Uh, JPL's official volunteer group. So we are trained by NASA to go out and, and talk about uh, current events at NASA, NASA history, uh, et cetera. So uh, this uh, this tour is is kind of going to is going to do double duty for both the the museum and for um, for the the solar system ambassadors. So uh, before we get going, uh, just want to uh, do a couple of logistics things. Uh, so I have been told that. Uh, the chat tab in, uh, in this uh, broadcast is for talking amongst yourselves and that if you have any questions for me directly, uh, please post them in the Q&A. So I'm going to largely be on the Q&A tab. And so if you want to, to ask a question about anything you see, uh, please post your questions uh, in the Q&A. And I'm thinking that as we go through the, the tour, it's probably going to be best to try to tackle questions as we go through uh, since navigating through the gallery is going to take uh, a little bit and we want to uh, tackle questions as we get to the uh, to the exact um, uh, spot without having to backtrack too much. So uh, in just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And hopefully you all will be able to see a... 3D representation of our uh, Apollo exhibit pop up, and uh, and uh, let me know if you do not see anything uh, appear. And let's see. Okay. Oh, so Todd Todd was asking how uh, how one gets uh, one of the Solar System Ambassador gigs. Uh, so there is a an application process. I believe it starts in the. I feel like I applied in the fall. So every year they. Um, they submit an, an application, uh, and and you the applications are reviewed. You have to have references, um, and often it helps to be recommended by another solar system ambassador. And then you go through a uh, a trial period once you're accepted. And that first year, uh, uh, you're sort of evaluated, and they just want to make sure that you're you're kind of following. Uh, the, the program, as it, as it were. Uh, all solar system ambassadors are required to do at least uh, four live presentations or, or now virtual presentations uh, as solar system ambassadors every year. And um, you get a lot, you get more webinars <laughs> on NASA events than anyone uh, could possibly attend. But uh, so there's a real nice kind of uh, insider uh, training on, on things going on in particular out of JPL uh, but also out of some of the other, um, other centers uh, to really give you that, that depth of knowledge to be able to go and present on 
uh, these topics. So it, it's a really great um, uh, program. I've I've been involved. I think this is my third year or fourth year uh, going into it. Uh, but uh, time is is a little bit weird at the moment. But anyway, so uh, with that uh, kind of beside us, uh, a little bit about the Museum of Flight. Uh, if those of you who are not familiar with us, we are the largest non-governmental air and space museum in the world. Uh, we have over 150 aircraft. Uh, we, and I think uh, several million uh, documents in our archives uh, and uh, 30,000 or so small objects. And we are located on Boeing Field, uh, just south of uh, downtown Seattle. Uh, we are a private 501c3, so a lot of people think that we are the Boeing Museum. We are good friends with the Boeing Company, but we are our own entity and we're uh, founded by Boeing. We were founded by a group of, uh, of like-minded individuals who all had an interest in aviation and decided to, that began as the Pacific Northwest uh, Aviation Historical Foundation, and all the way back in 1965, got our first permanent uh, museum in 1983 when we uh, accessioned uh, Boeing's Red Barn Aircraft Factory. So I am, so that's a, a little bit about us. Uh, we're gonna go into our Apollo exhibit, which you should see on the screen in front of you. Uh, please uh, let me know if it is not showing up. It looks like it should be in good shape. Um, uh, okay, so this gallery, uh, was goes from the beginnings of modern rocketry up through the post Apollo 1970s. Uh, so galleries at the museum, and a few years ago, uh, in in uh, 2015, about we got started on trying to our space presentations because all, museums tend to grow very organically. Um, there, there we go. Uh, museums tend to grow very organically. And so we had gotten to a point where we had three separate space exhibits, all telling uh, the beginnings of rocketry all the way up through what the future was going to be. And in 2015, our oldest of those, 1999, and it was going to be Venture Star and uh, and uh, single stage to orbits with, uh, with, uh, with Eros and the like. And so... <laughs> We decided it's probably time to to consolidate our uh, our offerings and and kind of get everything uh, a little bit better in line uh, and do uh, our galleries chronologically. So we we condensed. We didn't have room to do everything in a single gallery, so we condensed down to two. So this gallery first opened in 2017 uh, with the exhibit you see here, and then in 2019 we pulled it all out to host. Destination Moon, which was the uh, traveling exhibit of the Apollo 11 capsule from uh, the National Air and Space Museum. And then we put it back in time for uh, the anniversary of Apollo 12, which is important because uh, Pete Conrad in particular and Apollo 12 uh, feature pretty prominently in the gallery. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about some of that stuff uh, when we get to it. So, uh, so it's a, a sort of Mark II version of the, the 2017 exhibit. Uh, and so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into some of it. So uh, when I say we begin with, the, with modern rocketry, we do touch a little bit on uh, ancient, you know, Chinese fire arrows and the like, and the migration of, of gunpowder technology from uh, China through the Middle East and into Europe. Uh, but we really start with the, the folks started really thinking about rocketry for space travel. In particular, uh, we highlight Robert Goddard, Herman Oberth, and Antonin Tsiolkovsky. Uh, and among the artifacts we have here, uh, we have a full-scale model of Goddard's very first rocket, uh, which he built. And when we, we talk with, one of the things I love to talk about with this is the very unconventional configuration of the rocket. Um, it, uh, if you, when you're kind of looking at it, most people think, okay, a rocket has, and so one of the first things I always ask is, can you find the engine on it? Uh, and because this was in a, a tractor configuration, which it's my understanding Goddard thought would be more stable because the propellant tank would act as a keel. Now, ultimately he uh, realized that that was not necessary, uh, but he this was the first uh, successful uh, liquid fueled uh, rocket launch uh, in, uh, 
from where was he in Massachusetts in 1920? I can't remember if it's 23 or 26. Um, I think it was 23. Uh, and it went to a dizzying altitude of 41 feet. So all the rockets that that we launch, even on A and B engines, go a lot higher than than Goddard's first liquid fuel rocket. Uh, but the model here was custom built for the exhibit. Uh, so it is not original. However, we do have uh, a selection of parts laboratory at White Sands, which uh, include um, some of his uh, his gyroscopes, uh, some some nozzles that he was uh, toying with, and some some other components that uh, some of, and some of them date all the way back to that very first rocket launch. So it's um, this is really cool to to ha to kind of kick off. The exhibit with this uh, particular display, and it really establishes uh, White Sands as an important part of the the narrative of rocketry in the U.S. Which, um, obviously, as uh, model rocket enthusiasts, uh, uh, that is where the hobby, in a lot of ways, got started with uh, his famous uh, article on the on. The safest business in the world. Uh, so we we talk a bit about Goddard, uh, and then we hop into uh, the next big evolution in in terms of liquid fuel rocketry with the V two, which is as we all know very key to uh, to all of the early space programs, both the the U.S. space program and the the Soviet space program. So one of the things we have in this gallery is we have these full scale murals. These are one-to-one -one scale murals of various rockets as they, they grow throughout history. So we begin with Goddard's rocket. Now we've got our full-scale V2. And then the next uh, full-scale mural is an R7. And then we do a... So people can get a, a, a sense of just how big the rockets got and just how quickly they got at large. So uh, we cover the origins of uh, uh, sort of rockets uh, as pr liquid fuel production uh, in World War II with the V2 and uh, the that built it uh, during the war and it and its origins as the things that we really uh, did not want to shy away from was the intermingling of uh, milit the, the military use rockets and the that relationship with the the space race. Um, so just as we're going through this, I uh, just want to uh, once again uh, mention that I am monitoring the Q&A. So the chat tab is for chatting amongst yourself. And if you have a, a direct question about any of what we're going over, uh, please put it in. So let's see. So uh, one of the things that we often talk about is how uh, during those early days of, of rocketry, uh, thinking about space travel was not considered pursuit and how Goddard was was often uh, sort of uh, ridiculed as, as this, uh, this eccentric individual for wanting to think about rocketry for exploring space. And, uh, and a lot of that obviously began to change, at least to some degree, in the 1950s as uh, and post World War II, as the the technology, as popular culture really started to um, to highlight uh, the the potential for space travel. Though uh, I, it's my understanding that uh, at least within certain circles, uh, in particular uh, in the, in the Air Force, and talking about space, even having space on the name of a conference was completely verboten because they they didn't want it to to sound like something uh, something frivolous. So uh, we talk a bit about uh, uh, Von Braun played after Operation Paperclip in when he came over to the US and and kind of establishing himself as uh, as one of the, the, the prominent voices for popularizing uh, the idea of rocketry and space travel, uh, both through uh, his work with Walt Disney, as well as uh, some of his writings that appeared uh, very famously in, in Collier's magazine. Uh, and then we hop into uh, something that is, is near and dear to all of your and here's hearts, um, which is the development of 
model rocketry out of emerging out of amateur rocketry. So I, I want to take some time and, and kind of focus in a little bit more on this particular case. We've got uh, we've got our bio of G. Harry Stein, and and I'm sure most all of you know um, because we've presented on it quite a bit. But uh, in case you don't, uh, the Museum of Flight is uh, incredibly fortunate to be the uh, the uh, uh, to be the, the home of uh, G. Harry's personal archives. So we have all of his papers and his model rockets and uh, and a lot of the, the research that and, and um, items that he's collected over his long career, uh, both uh, in actual rocketry at, at White Sands and in hobby rocketry and in, as an both of uh, science fact and science fiction. So... Um, it's it's a really exciting uh, collection, and we actually just recently um, processed an addendum of his collection, which included a lot of stuff from his work at White Sands, which included uh, components from V2 rockets, uh, a piece of Trinitite, a lot of other uh, material that that he gathered during those early days um, uh, while he. Uh, and so, and of course, we've got. Uh, Vern over here holding his Saturn I model. Uh, we also have some elements of uh, Vern S the Vern and Estes collection uh, at the museum. We have been uh, working with Vern. It's our understanding that he is uh, he he still has a lot of his uh, archives at home because he is uh, uh, hard at work uh, on a on a, a book about his life and career. And so we wanted to you know we're 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 in conversation about uh, uh, bringing his collection uh, to the museum as well. And we also have uh, uh, Lee Peaster's uh, collection from his time with Centuri. And, and it's really interesting to see how the collections from these kind of founders of, of rocketry all uh, differ because uh, G. Harry had a lot of research files on actual rock stuff from his, his uh, career at White Sands. He also has a lot of built models. Lee's collection has a lot more of the business side of things. He's got a lot. He's got original artwork from uh, from uh, Centuri. He's got business plans. He's got catalogs. Those sorts of things. So it really uh, shows the the work that Centuri did in evolving in the game when it came to uh, how the hobby was presented to the public. Um, so it, it's really cool to to have this this to have these mixes of, of these different uh, collections that begin to build out a, a full picture of the hobby. So I know a close look at the artifacts. I'll zoom in as close as I can. So this case that we have here has a number of, uh, a number of artifacts that I, I really like to talk about. Um, I believe all of the orange rockets in there have uh, G. Harry's work on the fin. So those are all built by G. Harry Stein uh, back in the early days of rocketry. Uh, and we also have up here this white model uh, is is one that I always uh, touch on on tours because it's 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 a really uh, uh, oh okay I'm I'm hearing that that um, talk I'm getting a little sounds cut out a little bit um, so uh, this white rocket right right here in the front is a, a very exciting uh, piece for us this was actually built by Orville Carlyle and it's a Carlyle Mark II. And it has a shoelace as its shock cord. So if you if you know the the story of how uh, the hobby got going when uh, Carlisle wrote back to to G. Harry after reading uh, the safest business in the world, uh, and they formed Model Missiles Incorporated. And we are fairly certain that this is an early prototype of a Carlisle Mark II. Uh, and so it may very well be one of the earliest uh, model rocket kits uh, actually. Uh, fully ever assembled. So uh, that's something that we we always like to to call out when we're we're doing these tours. Um, the other thing I really like to talk about is uh, the stories of the the early international need in the 1960s. Uh, we have some motors that um, that uh, G. Uh, collected in uh, in uh, when he went over to uh, uh, accompanying the the teams over. And and uh, and uh, for the model rocket meets, and one of the, the really cool things about it, in the way I like to think about it, is 
at the height of the space race, there was this sort of space race in miniature that was just beginning with um, between and the thought of, of, of students from the US going behind the Iron Curtain to Eastern Bloc, uh, Soviet Bloc countries to compete in competition with, with students there. It's a really cool piece of, of how the, the culture race race uh, was evolving that a lot of folks had no idea was happening. And so, um, you know, whether or not are model rocketry enthusiasts already, I, I find that a lot of folks really uh, get uh, are and, and and surprised when they they learn that there was this this international exchange happening even at the height of of Cold War tension. So we've got our, our Dubnitsha motors there, and then uh, on the for the U.S. component, we've rocket shoots as well. So I'll just kind of pan up here for a second. And if anyone has any questions on what we've seen so far, please, uh, once again, uh, put any direct questions in the Q&A tab uh, and use uh, the chat tab for uh, discussion amongst yourself. So. Okay. All right. Well, then, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make my way around to our next stop. And Pardon the blur. I'm trying not to move too suddenly with, with all of this. So, so the the next uh, thing that we really like to to call out when we're over here, and let me see if I can get up to it, is we have get a good view, and we're running. It looks like we're running into. Let me see if I can find a different angle. Pardon the all the movement. Let's see. There we go. So you got a, a nice view of our full-scale R7 mural. Um, so one of the things we have here is we have a, a, a full-scale uh, mock-up of uh, Sputnik 1. And obviously, uh, the launch of Sputnik in 1957 was uh, one of the, the major catalyzing moments of the space race. In, in a lot of ways, it was the starting gun. Uh, and um, And one of the things that's really cool about our particular model of Sputnik is it was actually purchased at auction for the museum and was originally uh, owned by the Russian Academy of Sciences, which uh, was the, the organization that handled all of the, uh, the mission's uh, scientific aspects. So, um, and when we received it, there is evidence based on uh, the corrosion pattern on the inside that this particular model of, of Sputnik once had fully charged batteries. So we think this is probably about as close uh, uh, as close to the real thing here on Earth. Um, so uh, it, it, it does not have its inner components at uh, any longer, but we think that at, at, you know prior to it coming to the museum at some point, uh, this particular uh, Sputnik was uh, fully uh, equipped with um, with charged uh, electronics on the inside. So uh, we so Sputnik, of course, launched in uh, October of 1957. Um, it was part of uh, the Soviet Union's efforts for the International Geophysical Year, or IGY, which was a, a, a a global scientific effort, and both the United States and the Soviet Union uh, announced that they w wanted to have uh, satellite launches as part of that effort. Uh, the The overall goal of the IGY being to learn more about the Earth. And um, the U.S. announced uh, our efforts first, and we originally had two uh, going on. The first was uh, Vanguard uh, happening, uh, being sort of led by the Navy. And then there was uh, the Explorer program, which was led by the Army, specifically the Ballistic um, uh, Missile Agency, which uh, Von Braun had uh, moved to, uh, to take charge of. Um, and the Explorer program got canceled or put in mothballs uh, as we were trying to consolidate down to, to one program for IGY once we found out that uh, the Soviets are, are actually trying to do their own thing. So we put all our eggs into Vanguard. Uh, the Soviets 
kept having failures of the R7 rocket, which you can you can see the full scale mural back there. A, a successful test, and shortly thereafter, they put Sputnik up before we were able to launch anything. And then, to add to the embarrassment, when we finally did try to launch Vanguard, it exploded on the launch pad. So. After that, uh, the US reactivated the Explorer program and managed to put up Explorer 1. And we have a, a model which was built for the exhibit of Explorer here ne hanging next to Sputnik. And uh, it was a lot smaller than Sputnik, uh, but in a lot of ways, it achieved a lot more scientific ways. Uh, Sputnik just had a radio transmitter on board, and they could do some things by uh, monitoring the radio, the frequency of the radio waves and the shift in that frequency in order to determine uh, some particulars of atmospheric density and the like. But, but really, it was largely a uh, uh, a PR and a, and a flex by the, by the Soviet Union. You know, there's a reason that they broadcast on a frequency that could be picked up by ham operators. Um, but and then for Explorer, uh, one of the things that it had were the, these antennas which could uh, m measure the, the radiation environment in space. And Explorer 1 uh, made the incredible discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts, um, uh, Van Allen being the principal investigator uh, on the, the particular, on that mission. So uh, we've got those two hanging right next to each other. And so very shortly after the getting the satellite space, uh, the space race really got off and running very quickly. And within a year, uh, this was prior to the formation of NASA, uh, within a year, NASA had been, uh, had been formed uh, and convert, and basically they converted the, um, uh, the NACA into, uh, uh, to include um, space in, in its charter. And NASA absorbed a lot of the NACA um, facilities at, at Langley and, and, at, at, um, and out at um, uh, Edwards uh, to then begin focus in addition to its ongoing work in, in uh, aviation. Uh, and then within two years, we had selected our first astronauts because uh, quickly after getting the, the space race or getting the satellite for satellite, looking at, okay, how do we get people up there? So one of the next spots I often go to on my tours is over here. Of course, uh, when launching people into orbit, uh, we uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Uh, Thomas is asking about uh, the Soviet preference for spherical vehicles versus everyone else using cylinders and. Uh, one of the, the, so you can see here, this is an example of what's called a research module. So it's basically a car variant of Vostok, uh, very similar to the, the capsule that Gagarin launched in, but, uh, but without a lot for uh, a person in an ejection seat like this. I do not know for sure. My suspicion is that uh, the Soviets had not figured out landing yet. They were, they're, early vehicles were incredibly simple. So uh, Gagarin on his launch, when he, after he came through the heat of re-entry, he actually had to eject out of the capsule before it landed. So they had, um, uh, they were, they were getting folks, they were still working out all of the, the particulars for having a, a, a successful mission. And I suspect that is why they started with, uh, uh, with spheres for their um, for their vehicles. Once they get to to Soyuz, uh, Soyuz has the it has an off center. They, they had gotten um, dynamic reentry a little more dialed in by the time they got to Soyuz. So rather than just having this basically a person in a cannonball uh, coming back in, uh, the Soyuz has an offset center of gravity, so it, it will uh, bleed off energy by doing that skiing motion, which is similar to, to what the, the shuttle did, uh, when it would, would re-enter. So, um, so they, they, I, I suspect that the early, the, the spherical re-entry capsules early on were, uh, in part because they were going quick and they were still figuring things out as even after they had started launching folks. So, uh, 
again, uh, Gagarin, Yuri Gagarin uh, launched in April of 1961, uh, becoming the first uh, human to uh, to go into space and the first human to orbit the Earth. He did a single orbit and he ejected out of his capsule before uh, uh, before uh, uh, landing. So you could you could argue that okay, did he really? Because he didn't he didn't achieve a stable orbit, but he definitely made it into space. Um, wore a spacesuit that looked just like this one. Uh, this is an early Soviet uh, spacesuit. It's one of just a. Few existence uh, in the Western Hemisphere. The suit is real. Uh, we've put it in a mock-up of the ejection seat like Gagarin uh, uh, wrote in, uh, went, ejected out of it when he uh, was in the capsule. And and basically uh, for the first capsule, he, he was basically just kind of slotted in there. He couldn't move around or, or anything. He was, he, was, he was kind of enclosed in almost this, this tube of of uh, monitors and, and equipment, and then uh, it uh, reentry. So uh, th the U.S. did manage to uh, to to heard the following month, uh, and and the next kind of big step that we we often talk about on our um, uh, on our our tours is where the U.S. was in base knowledge. Uh, when President Kennedy first made uh, his famous uh, declaration about, uh, and we had we had spent our astronauts had spent a total of 15 minutes in space. Uh, Kennedy made the announcement just a little bit after Shepard's launch. His first, his most famous speech is the one at Rice University, but that doesn't come for like another year. But he made uh, a version of his space speech. Um, to a joint session of Congress in which he announced the moon landing as the finish line for the space race. And one of the, one of the, the things that a lot of people don't, re don't realize is just how deliberate that selection of a finish line was. Uh, there were letters that went back and forth between NASA and uh, the Kennedy administration trying strategizing about, okay, the Soviets are ahead of us. How do we win? Uh, and they are. They were talking about things like considering things like putting a, a space station in Earth orbit, sending astronauts around the moon, robot on the moon. Uh, you know, all of these different things that they were thinking about. And ultimately, they settled on landing astronauts on the moon for a couple of reasons. One, it had very clear success failure uh, uh, criteria. They would land and they would get them back to Earth safely. And that was the, the criteria for success. Apologize for the, the autofocus uh, issues. Um, it also would be inspirational uh, it, for for the, the public and, and would be able to get the, the public behind it. And a, a third big reason for it was uh, it would require enough technological development by both the US and the Soviet Union that it would give us uh, time to be able to catch up and get past uh, the, the Russians who had uh, better heavy lift rockets at the time. So again, we had, we had spent a of 15 minutes with astronauts in space when he first made that announcement. Uh, and also one of the things I, that I talk to people about that in thinking about is what did we know about the moon at that time? Everything that we knew about the moon uh, when Kennedy first made the announcement of the moon landing, we had gathered by standing on the ground and looking up at the night sky from here on Earth, either through a telescope or with our with the naked eye. So the one of the first things we needed to figure out where we were actually going. We needed much better roadmaps uh, to have a successful thing. And that is one of the, the key places where Seattle comes into this story. And uh, since we are based in Seattle, we of course want to make sure to tell that story. So um, so in order to better uh, understand where we were trying to get to, uh, NASA commissioned Boeing to build uh, a series of spacecraft called lunar orbiters. And I'm going to zoom in here. We've got a small uh, subscale model of sort of desktop scale of the, the lunar orbiter spacecraft. But you can see kind of uh, with people uh, in the, the background, 
uh, how big it was. So the, the lunar orbiters were, uh, were five uh, robotic probes that were launched to fly around the moon and map the, the surface of the moon by taking high resolution, the first high resolution up close photos of the lunar surface. Um, and they were all incredibly successful. Uh, they were built in the mid 1960s at um, Boeing's uh, space and missile space and missile uh, plant, which was just north of where the and an interesting bit of trivia about the building where it was ha where it was located is it was originally uh, Ford's Model T assembly line for uh, for our area, and then it had been purchased by Boeing, and, and Boeing was now using it uh, for building things like Bomark, Bomark and the like. Um, so they they used that that uh, facility to build the the spacecraft, and meanwhile Boeing was also building its own dedicated space center uh, down in Kent, Washington, about. Um, maybe 20 minutes south of, of where the museum uh, is. And that space center, they equipped it with, with various test facilities. Uh, this vacuum chamber that you see there is, uh, is the one that was located at the Boeing Space Center. Uh, and, uh, and so once the, the orbit then tested down at this newly opened facility in Kent before launching, and I believe the first, um, the first mission was, I believe in 66. Um, so, uh, the orbiter successfully mapped uh, of the lunar surface, and so we were we were we had our up close high resolution images. And one of the things that is fascinating about how these spacecraft operated was just how they got the photos. Uh, oh, okay, uh, Ron Ron said my audio cut out. Uh, he was asking where the the probes were were built. Uh, they were built in Kent, Washington. Uh, which is located about half an hour south of uh, the museum. So, uh, and, and at uh, what was called Boeing Boeing Space Center, uh, it was this dedicated facility. A small image of it here. Um, let's see, I can't zoom in any further, unfortunately. Um, but it was uh, it built down in um, uh, in Kent. And uh, located right, uh, okay, Pat, uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, Pat's saying it, it's right by where uh, Narum 14 was. Actually, it's also now pretty much right across the street from where Blue Origins headquarters is. So, um, oh, okay, uh, let's see. I've got a, a question asking what the ablated sphere is that that was next to, to Sputnik. We'll we'll hop back to that in just a, in just a moment. Um, so, uh, so the the uh, the lunar orbiters, uh, the way they got the images back was was fascinating. They they of course recorded. They took the pictures on actual film. Uh, so they. The film then had to be developed on the spacecraft automatically. It was and, and transmitted back to Earth. And it, it arrived at one of three large ground stations, which are kind of the core sites of the Deep Space Network. Uh, there was one in Australia. There was one in near Goldstone in California. And then there was one outside of Madrid, Spain. And the, when the photos arrived at the, the ground stations, they printed out on individual five millimeter film strips, which were then hand taped together on a light board to make the larger image. And an, an example image of it kind of down here. Let me see if I can get a better angle on it. I don't know if I can. But um, so one of the things you'll notice in photos from uh, from the lunar orbiter, um, let's see here, go to full screen. Okay, um, so one of the things that you'll you'll notice when you look at photos of lunar orbiter uh, photos is that they, they appear to have these striations in them. And that's from hand taping those 35 millimeter film strips together. Now, in addition to mapping the full surface of the moon, uh, this, uh, this program also captured the very first photo of Earth taken from around the moon. A lot of folks think that was Earthrise, but that was, uh, but this photo dates it by like um, 
several years, uh, not quite half a decade, but, um, but so this is that photo. Uh, it was black and white. Uh, and that photo came down at the ground station outside of Madrid. There was a engineers uh, located uh, at that um, at that ground station. And this particular individual here was uh, in charge of taping together that very first photo of Earth from taken from the moon as it as it came down. And uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this uh, particular image of him is that uh, he taped it together backwards the first time and then had to completely redo his work. <laughs> uh, so it, it was this really uh, uh, in-depth process that required teams at each of these ground to then hand assemble these these images. But they managed to get the full lunar surface and then they, they would take the photos, they sent them to NASA where they were basically uh, laid out and, and in collage in order to uh, get a complete picture of what moon looked like. Um, and uh, another interesting thing uh, about this individual, his name's John Doherty. Uh, he actually is still around. He lives uh, in Bellevue, just east of where the museum is. And uh, shortly after this exhibit opened, he renewed his Museum of Flight membership. So, <laughs> uh, so clearly, uh, I, I think I, I hope that he has had a chance to uh, to notice his contribution to this uh, particular story. Um, but uh, so NASA got the 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 photos, and then they were sent to the Air Force Chart Center in St. Louis in order to basically convert them to essentially roadmaps, topographical maps of the Moon, uh, from which the the landings uh, approaches were plotted. So uh, we had a question about what the ablated sphere is over here, and I'm going to just pop back over to a good view of it. And I imagine I'm, yeah, I'm already, <laughs> we're, we're less than halfway through, and I've already, we're almost uh, halfway through our time. So I'll try to keep keep moving along so we have lots of time for, for questions, uh, the really good stuff. Um, so this sphere here is, is what's... So resource uh, is uh, Russian for resource, um, and it is the, a cargo variant essentially uh, derived from the Vostok capsule. So it's roughly the same size and spherical in shape. This particular one is actually an early a commercial, you could call it private space effort. Uh, so this um, this named uh, Columbus's star, and it was actually not launched until the early 1990s. It was launched. Uh, for the 500th anniversary of uh, Columbus's arrival uh, in the Americas. And it was launched as a, a goodwill gesture uh, after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, it, was, it was launched as a, a goodwill gesture uh, to the United States and it splashed down off the coast of uh, Washington and was brought into port in Seattle. And I believe it was, um, uh, it, it was used in, I think, a Thanksgiving Day parade in Seattle as, as like one of the, the displays before being donated to the museum. So it was filled with um, lots of uh, ephemera and, and well wishes. And uh, the museum has a lot of the that came along with it as these goodwill gifts uh, as well in our collection. Um, but that effort was uh, coordinated by a group of private uh, um, Individuals who who, uh, who who acquired the the rocket and 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 arranged for it to be uh, launched. So um, so it, it's an interesting example of both uh, the the very beginnings of the the space program and also some of the the early uh, to to launch outside of official government missions. And real quick for this group here, since we're all space buffs already, we have uh, scale, uh, same scale models of uh, the three kind of key uh, US uh, space pro uh, programs that built on each other. Mercury capsule down here, we've got our Gemini capsule here, and then our Apollo capsule. So you can kind of get a, visitors can get a, a, a real uh, quick visual of just how much the, the vehicles grew as we were trying to figure out um, how to get to the moon. And um, let's see. And I'm 
tr tr trying to make sure that I've got all of our uh, all of our questions covered. Okay, so one of the things we you know we talk about is is the how the mission roles evolve because that's really key, especially when talking about um, the the Gemini program. Uh, Mercury was all about just seeing can we get an astronaut into space and into orbit safely and get them back. Uh, vehicle is really limited in what it could do. And then the Gemini program is really where we had to figure out all of the, the problems that we would need to overcome before we were, would be able, able to go to the moon. And so that included, okay, how long can we, can humans survive in space? Can they get to the moon and back? We didn't know what would happen to the human body. We didn't know where our eyes uh, change shape and we'd go blind really quickly. Uh, would we stop digesting properly? Uh, you know, what's the radiation environment like? Uh, so there was a lot of um, that we needed to figure out. Uh, since we settled on the lunar orbit rendezvous method, we needed to know how to rendezvous and dock two spacecraft uh, in orbit together and, and, and be able to change orbits in order to, uh, to, to do a, a translunar injection and the like. And uh, the last thing, the, well, there were lots of, the last big ones that we really needed to sort out was if we got to the moon, we were going to want to get out and walk around our spacecraft. Uh, so we needed to figure out how astronauts could operate safely and efficiently uh, outside of their, their vehicle. So the first spacewalks uh, for the, on the U.S. side were conducted as part of the, the Gemini program. So, and I mentioned that uh, at the beginning that Apollo 12 plays pretty prominently in there. And a big part of the, the reason for that is we have quite a, a lot of material from uh, Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad. And Pete was a fascinating, I mean, all the astronauts were fascinating, but Pete was, was particularly uh, fascinating when it comes to, to his life and history. Um, he did not grow up with your... Okay. Astronauts are high achievers from the beginning, and they and you know they, they they always tell you, okay, if you want to be really well in school, and you need to study hard and and uh, and 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 keep your you know uh, keep your nose clean kind of thing. And so you get this vision of you know the all American uh, 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 multi threat, you know, super smart, super athletic, etc. Uh, Pete high school and he had uh he also uh he was dyslexic uh, before they really understood like they knew that dyslexia existed but they they did not how to treat it and how to to um to really uh help people who had dyslexia succeed so in his early life he had a lot of struggles in school and he acted out a lot because of that uh, ultimate, he he started when he was his the first school he went to was a place called the Haverford School in uh, near where he grew up in Pennsylvania, and uh, the Haverford School was this this really traditional uh, private school, uh, and he got in a lot of trouble there and really struggled as a and he uh, ended up the the straw that broke the camel's back was. Uh, Pete had this Indian motorcycle that he had gotten from, I think, his cousin. Uh, and he loved that Indian motorcycle. He would take it apart. And, you know, he had a lot of, like, mechanical skill. But uh, he ended up riding that motorcycle shirtless through the school. It was the last straw, and he ended up getting expelled. Uh, and in some ways, that ended up, be ended up being the turnaround that he needed. Because... Uh, he transferred from this very traditional Haverford school to a Darrow was different because they still had the academic rigor, but they paired it with a lot of uh, hands-on activity. So they would be building new uh, facilities around the school. They'd be chopping wood. So he was able to get out and work with his hands. And so he went from this, this struggling, failing student to... Uh, to the captain of the football team, despite being the smallest guy on the squad, uh, excelling in in his academics. Once again, he still had to to struggle with the dyslexia, but he um, he uh, ended up 
uh, just because of the environment doing a lot better and uh, ultimately ended up with a full ride ROTC scholarship to Princeton. Sorry about uh, after he had been expelled from Haverford, he's walking around uh, town near his home and he runs into his old headmaster and his headmaster kind of looking down his nose at him is like, so, so, you know, oh, Conrad, what's, what are you up to these days? And he said, well, I'm, I'm on a, a full Navy ROTC scholarship to Princeton. So, so that was, was really what was needed in order to, to get his life turned around. Now, uh, the other thing about Conrad is he still had that mischievous personality and um, he applied for the Mercury uh, program. The astronauts who went through the, the testing uh, for that, but he was rejected. And uh, the sort of apocryphal story is that, and I, I don't know how much truth is there is in this, or but I could, knowing what I've read about Pete, um, the apocryphal story is he got fed up with the medical testing enough that he left a biological sample on the the main flight surgeon's uh, desk, and. The official uh, reasoning for him getting rejected from the Mercury program was that he had uh, a personality that was not conducive to uh, to long duration spaceflight. And the irony there is that once Pete was selected as part of the next nine, the class of NASA astronauts, he would go on to set two uh, duration records as as an astronaut. Um, so uh, we here we've got his, uh, and so he was selected. That ne those next nine astronauts were selected as part of the program, um, and we've got his G two C. The G two C was uh, the prototype for the G three C spacesuit that was worn on most on most of the um, the Gemini flights and one of the big differences is it's the 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 two had still silver uh, aluminized um uh uh coating that was similar to the mercury uh they didn't wear they wore white suits on their missions they didn't uh this version was not worn on the mission uh had uh various training and, and press photos and things like that taken while wearing um so we've got uh, Pete's uh, silver G2C uh, spacesuit. Let me see if I can get a closer look. It's just the cover of any of the, the plugs or, or the bladders or, or things like that. Though it, it is interesting because the tag up in the collar, the Conrad. Okay. And I, I know I've been going, trying to go kind of fast because I've got a lot to talk about. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to chime in on the Q&A tab. Uh, once again, uh, the chat tab is just for uh, the spacecraft center, which really became uh, which is now Johnson Space Center, which uh, became the the, uh, the, uh, the for the astronauts, astronauts the, the main training, training facility and the main kind of uh, astronaut offices. Uh, these consoles here are um, actual Apollo era consoles. They were not from the the main uh, Moker. One of the things that the movies never really uh, uh, cover is you know they, in the movies like all the all the hard happens in that that main mission control room but they had back rooms with additional support teams on additional consoles uh basically feeding uh information into the the main flight control room and, and doing uh quite a bit of the the work so these these consoles were from one of those um those back back rooms and uh back prior to this exhibit opening we uh, uh nasa flight controller Cy Lieb got to to help uh, outfit these uh these consoles uh, to look like uh, an actual Capcom station and an actual Ecom station. So uh, capsule commander and uh, environmental uh, control. Okay. Um, so folks are saying that I am breaking up and freezing occasionally. 
for everyone, or I, I, I am getting kind of excited and accidentally smacking my microphone, so that might be that might be the reason for for some of the audio issues. Uh, but I I, I think some of the 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 bandwidth it it can. Let's see. Here. I don't know that I've got. Okay. Yeah, I've, I'm, I don't know that there's a lot I can do on my end it, it, or if it's uh, something happening on my end or if folks have slower connections at home. Uh, these I'm trying to, to not move the tour around too much so that it, it limits the, the, the processing power we need to um, we need to, to do this. So. So during the, the, the Gemini program. One of one of the other uh, uh, stories that I, I love to tell with with certain groups is uh, uh, are any of I imagine that some of you in in the the audience are familiar with uh, the Turtle Club, um, uh, and the if you are not, uh, oh, Pat Pat's gaming somewhere in the museum. Well, fortunately, I'm I'm actually at home, so if anyone's gaming, it's probably my my children maybe, but I, I um, uh, so, uh, uh, so the turtle club was this facetious drinking club that began in, uh, that began in or two, uh, among, uh, the U S forces who were poking a little bit of fun, uh, at, uh, the British because, uh, social uh, fraternal organizations, um, and the Turtle Club was built on uh, double entendre, largely. Uh, and among the rules of the Turtle Club, um, let's see, no. so okay, so we're we're I'm hearing that the the stream is hanging on occasion. Let's see. I'm trying to make sure uh, everything is as, as shut down as, as possible. Let me just make sure there's I'll send a message here. All right, uh, Bernard. I, I like that idea, <laughs> uh, and I, I've just sent a, sent a message out to to my wife to to make sure that folks are are off of other devices around here. Uh, but I, I do like Bernard's suggestion of blaming it on Pat. Um, anyway, so the the Turtle Club was this this facetious uh, drinking organization. Um, uh, which was uh, based largely on double entendre. And in the book, uh, there was an assumption that every member of the Turtle Club had a particular donkey. And one of the other rules was that if anyone asked you, are you a turtle? Uh, In, in in this organization. And one of the things that they liked to do was they would mess with each other when it was very inconvenient to give that proper answer. And one of the, the first times this happened was on Wally Shiraz's Mercury flight. And you can 
transcript, and you can see this uh, in the transcript, uh, is in uh, the flight at, at uh, as he's launching, he's still going uphill. Deke slips on audio and and asks, uh, "Wally, are you a turtle today?" And Wally and Shara thinking fast, and and uh, he. Uh, he uh, switches over to his, his on uh, to his, his his on capsule voice recorder, records the proper answer, and then on the the the, street, the, the public affairs stream, he just responds, "You bet." And then when he gets back down, he uh, he shows uh, uh, or plays the correct answer for everyone to to prove that he had recorded it. Well, when Shara went up on his Apollo flight. He got back at Deke, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to zoom in uh, far enough to to really see it. Is uh, so during a, a a live broadcast during uh, Shara's flight, he holds up a sign that says "Deke, are you a turtle?" <laughs> and I I don't know how Deke handled it. I don't think Deke was necessarily on uh, on comms at the moment, but uh, that was. Just this example, and we've got several other uh, that we'll go over uh, down the line of of uh, the, the the ways the astronauts with each other in another way, very high stress job. And uh, did you unmute? Are, are there people here in uh, Todd's audio? Let's see. I'm, I'm hearing so, dishes. Like, You're hearing some feedback. I'll click it off. Oh, uh, Todd, no, I'm just hearing your your dishes clattering in the background. Should be. Um. So uh, one of the things we have is uh, is Conrad's Turtle Club pin uh, on on display there as as part of uh, part of that story. So the the Turtle Club. Uh, like lasted beyond the Apollo program um, and included folks, uh, <laughs> yep, pots and pans, included as high up as I believe President Kennedy was actually also uh, a turtle. And Shara went on to be uh, the, the the grand poovah or, or whatever that the, the head turtle uh, is for the organization. And if you go to his website, even though he's, he's passed, you can, uh, there's still a lot of uh, description of all the various uh, entry tests and and how people become turtles and all the uh, all of these these stories. So um, so here so we're 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 kind of in the middle of the, the the Gemini program. And one last little story that I'd I'd like to tell around that is uh, so yeah. And Ed, I have sent a, a message to my my wife asking um, asking them to uh, to suspend their. I think they were watching TV and, and just got a confirmation that that they are doing so. So, so hopefully the 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 bandwidth is prove slightly. Um, check real quick is whether or not. So, um, so, uh, program, we mentioned that one of the, the goals was to see if we could get to space or stay in space long enough to, to get all the way to the moon, uh, and back. And so, uh, Gemini five was, uh, a, a key and it was also the point where the, the United States finally pulled ahead of the Soviet Union in the space race to the moon. And uh, it's also interesting because it was the first mission to have a mission patch. So, um, let's see. I'm just going to go ahead and clear some of these questions because I have old questions that keep popping back up. So, prior to Gemini 5, and so if you're a collector, if you see any mission patches, uh, from the Mercury program or from Gemini three or four, uh, those are 
unofficial. Those were created after the fact. Um, so uh, with Gemini 5 was the first to have uh, to fly with with a patch. And those were um, and to get it to happen. So uh, that mission was um, Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad. And they uh, the goal of the mission was to to have the first mission in space that lasted longer than a week. And they were uh, and the my understanding is the backstory is Cooper got inspired by a wooden uh, uh, Conestoga wagon that Pete Conrad's father-in-law, who was a rancher, had, had carved. And so they created this uh, sort of an Oregon Trail vibe uh, with a wagon that on the side of it said eight days or bust. And they wanted to, to have this mission patch. It was a callback to their, their military uh, uh, kind of traditions. And Jim Webb, who was the administrator at the time, said, absolutely not. No patches. He didn't, he did not want them to, to have a mission patch. And it, it ultimately resolved when uh, Conrad and Cooper actually flew up to DC uh, and apparently nearly ended up in a fist fight between Pete Conrad and the NASA administrator uh, before they managed to, uh, to, to come to an agreement and got to the root of what Webb's concern was. And his main concern was eight days are bust on the side. And the compromise they came to was they could fly as long as they didn't have eight days or bust on the side of the wagon. And his reasoning was if they were up for seven days, completed all of their mission objectives, but then had to come down early, the press would report it as a bust. So they uh, they covered the, the eight days or bust uh, or removed it from the the patches that they actually flew with and then re-added it uh, after, the, after the fact. But that was the very first NASA mission patch had a crew, and from that day to this day, the crew always designs their mission patch. And uh, uh, this particular patch that we have here uh, accompanied Pete Conrad to uh, on Apollo. Um, so it, it, it's this this really uh, uh, interesting tradition, NASA. and this is is where it where it all began. So. So let's see, we are, we are over an hour in and uh, I'm just getting to heading to the moon. So uh, we've got this case here just before we go far. We've got these rockets, these models here are built to the same scale. So we go all the way from the Mercury Redstone up to the Saturn V. And it really provides a, a stark visual on just how much that rocket technology had to grow in order to, to successfully get us uh, from suborbital flux. Um, and then also we'd like to pause here. Uh, our local uh, Apollo astronaut was uh, Dick Gordon, who was the command module pilot on, uh, on Apollo 12. Uh, we have some uh, Apollo guys who have moved to the area um, after the fact. Bill Anders lives uh, up by the Canadian border and, and runs his own uh, small museum. But uh, Dick Gordon is our local boy. He was born in Kingston, Washington, uh, which is this uh, small uh, across, um, across Puget Sound north of, of Seattle. Uh, and this is his uh, Gemini 11 flight suit. So, um, and he passed away a few years ago, but he always considered the Museum of Flight his museum. And when this exhibit opened, opening banquet, and he brought all his friends from kindergarten. <laughs> so, so uh, he was, he was a really good guy and a, and a good friend of the museum. And we were sad that, that he, he left us a few, few years back. Um, so next spot, we've got our uh, cl classic 1960s uh, living room. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to, to hit home is the vast majority of people experienced the Apollo moon landing like this. Uh, they, they watched it on, on someone else's television if they didn't have one. Uh, and, and they weren't at the launches. They obviously weren't uh, in mission control or, or on the moon. Most people, this is how they experienced it. Um, and so we've got our little uh, prototypical 1960s living room. And you'll notice there is uh, another, I believe it's an Astron Mark, uh, 
down here. And this is another NAR-2 uh, rocket, uh, one of G. Harry's uh, uh, rockets that he built and flew, uh, just sort of snuck in the case there. One of the, the fun stories I like to tell, uh, <laughs> that's behind-the-scenes fun, is uh, this print here. So this is known as the incident on the Banana River. And the story behind this is that uh, Pete Conrad and Neil Armstrong were very opposite personalities. Uh, and uh, Neil was, was quiet. He was very cerebral. Pete was very, you know, they were both incredible pilots and, and incredible engineers. Uh, but... Pete was was really boisterous and 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 kind of a prankster, and Neil was was much more reserved. But the way um, Mark Armstrong, Neil's youngest, they were kind of like yin and yang. So they were actually really good friends, and often like on their days off would would do stuff together. And on this particular, go water skiing on the Banana River. And the way Mark tells the story, and he tells it way better than I do, is uh, Pete was driving, and Neil Armstrong was was water skiing behind the boat. So if you if you can imagine how Pete was probably driving and and it was likely Pete looking over his shoulder doing his best to and they miss a turn and run the boat aground. Well then one of the other astronauts learned Navy test pilots had lost control of their watercraft and he runs out and takes a photo of of the standing next to their boat. And he doesn't end there. He then goes and commissions two paintings of the photo, uh, which then uh, 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 become uh, immortalized. One is given to, given to the Conrad family uh, to immortalize the incident on the on the Banana River. And our print that we have here in our living in this living room was was taken from the Armstrong family's copy of. Of the of the original incident on the Banana River painting, so um, so a, a question here asking uh, uh, from George uh, and George, I apologize if I, I butcher your, your last name, uh, uh, Rakor or Rashor. Um, uh, uh, is the museum currently open or restricted? We are currently open. Uh, we do. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, county and uh, and mandates that that provide restrictions um masks are required and proof of vaccine or proof of a recent negative um uh, covid test are required for uh for entry uh one is a one is a king county requirement so uh we do have the the general public uh coming through the museum uh, uh we've actually weathered the uh the pandemic really really well so um so yeah uh, going strong. So from the, the living room, uh, one of the things we, we also like to, to talk about, so this is one of the favorite dirty tricks that people who work in science museums like to play on children when they're talking about the distance between the Earth and the Moon, is if the Earth is the size of, size of a basketball, the Moon would be about the size of a tennis ball. And the, the dirty trick is you hand one child both of these objects and you say, this is your basketball Earth and this is your tennis ball Moon. How far apart are they? in reality. And the kids will kind of hold their arms out. Uh, when in reality, uh, they are this far apart. This is a two scale earth moon trajectory with our basketball earth here and our tennis ball moon down at the end of this wall. It's about, I think it's roughly 24 feet or so. Um, so this, we're just trying to capture, we took uh, one of the, you know, we modeled it off of uh, kind of lunar um, trajectory charts that NASA used, which squish everything a lot closer together, um, and tried to, to roughly get all of the mid-course corrections and, and other major maneuvers uh, into the uh, into the right spot. Of course, the one thing we could not do is get the orbit height accurate because you'd basically it, you wouldn't even be able to see it. So that part is is not to scale, but the 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 translunar injection, trans-Earth injection, are um, are to scale on this uh, on this uh, path, and each of these, when you come to the actual museum, these are each uh, uh, video small video 
uh, the different staging and like the lem extraction and things like that at approximately the, the point uh, where they would have happened uh, called out in these little pits. So. So, and getting to the moon, of course, was uh, an incredible uh, feat. You know, all of these calculations, you're dealing with curves uh, and, and all the, the and, and gravitational uh, uh, fluctuations. So, uh, and early on in the program, especially, we didn't have, could make those calculations. So uh, we call out Catherine Johnson and, and the West End computers for all the, the work that they, they some of this, the, the mathematics uh, behind this. Um, and even once the computers did start to be introduced, um, they were uh, all checked by hand uh, by folks in Mission Control and, and others. So now we get to, uh, the missions to the moon. And this uh, spacesuit here is, is John from Apollo 10. It's on loan from the National Air and Space Museum. So it's it's the real deal. And so when you come in here, uh, you and this is our Apollo gallery. So we'll get up close with a couple of these things. Um, uh, we've got about just under 40 minutes left in our, in, in our official time, though I'm told that we can potentially go a little longer. Uh, so our com command module here uh, never actually flew, that, but this is a very important uh, piece of history. This is the first production line com command module built for the Apollo program. This is uh, command module 007A. And the reason it has that A in its designation is it was originally a block one module. So it had the uh, the inward opening that was, was um, this that contributed to the deaths in the Apollo one uh, fire. Um, and our capsule in particular the redesign uh, to test uh, the redesign for the integrated outward opening hatch. So we've got um, our uh, capsule here, and then we've got the, the integrated hatch with all the uh, the workings that show uh, the updates um, uh, facing out uh, over next to it. So the uh, this particular capsule obviously never went to space, way too shiny for that. Uh, but it was a very important uh, test article. And in addition to, uh, to working on the, uh, on the, you know, being part of the hatch testing, uh, our particular capsule also put the ship in spaceship. So it was used for long duration um, water survivability tests. So if the astronauts splash down off target, they'd want to know that they could survive in their capsule as a lifeboat in the ocean long enough for the, the recovery fleet to reach them. So uh, several astronauts, including uh, Jim Lovell, uh, spent a few days floating around the Gulf of Mexico in our capsule as, uh, as, as a life raft. Um, your question about the, the descent stage. Uh, so good question. It, we have our ascent stage here. We do not have a... Uh, this module was, was actually an art piece uh, built by a guy named Steve Brown. He's a huge space buff. Uh, he does props for movies and the like. Uh, and he, uh, in, in, for, I'm not sure the exact reason, reason, but I think he only mocked up the ascent uh, stage. This is actually uh, modeled after the ascent stage of Apollo 17. He kitted out on the interior as well. We actually have a scan similar to for the gallery with the, the interior. And it's my understanding before I came to the museum that uh, and a couple of the other Apollo guys who were out uh, at the museum for an event got a chance to to take a look inside there and they they verified uh, uh, its its um, its its credibility <laughs> as in, in terms of its its design. So uh, this has been on display through several iterations of uh, the Apollo exhibit. It was originally a loan from the artist, but uh, we actually recently, just recently, uh, acquired it from him as a, a permanent part of the, the collection. So, uh, other very cool or really cool elements to keep us like to talk about is we have uh, not one, but two F Apollo F1, Saturn V F1 engines, Rocketdyne F1 engines uh, in the exhibit. 
And if I can pop right over here, I think this is probably the best spot to, to take a look. Um, we have our before engine. Uh, this is a, an actual engine that was originally uh, assigned to Apollo 16 uh, when they had a, a fire during a, a static test uh, fire that damaged uh, the engine. So it was pulled off, it was refurbished, and it was reassigned as a flight spare uh, for Apollos 18 and 19. So when those were canceled, it was mothballed. But then actually it was um, once they started ramping up SLS and were trying to decide whether or not to use uh, Apollo era hardware or uh, shuttle era hardware on the, the, the core stage of, of the space launch system. Uh, and one of the things they realized is they had a whole, NASA realized they had a whole generation of propulsion engineers who did not have large LOX kerosene engines. So they actually, from NASA Marshall, uh, we got from them uh, 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 for the exhibit. exhibit. And one, one of the really interesting things is when, when it got in here and was stood up, it started leaking Apollo era kerosene. <laughs> so we actually have a relief valve on there. And because this whole engine hadn't been fired, it was just a gas generator that was actually pulled off that was fired. It wasn't that part of the system that was 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 leaking, but uh, yeah, we ha we had to install a relief valve in order to in order to drain it. But it was an interesting, unexpected bit of history when we we brought it in. So this is our before engine. A Rocketdyne F1 looks like after spending over four decades on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. This guy here was one of the big reasons. Uh, why we ended up in this yep. gallery. So um, in this is one of the things that was brought up from the bottom of the Atlantic by Jeff Bezos. And we found out about this mission when he made his and said, uh, announcing that they had found the F1 engines and that they were planning on bringing them up. And that if he was able to bring up two, he wanted one to go to the National Air and Space Museum and one to come to Seattle to the Museum of Flight. And so we thought, okay, uh, we better figure out what we're gonna do about this because we're probably gonna be getting one. And sure enough, uh, we received the engine in 2015 and then 2017. So our engine is a little bit of a, um, of a, a, a chimera. Uh, the thrust chamber here is the number three engine from Apollo 12. So again, Conrad's missions, Apollo 12, in fact, in this gallery. Uh, so, so this whole part down here is the number three engine from Apollo 12. And then this, uh, the generator, what the, the recovery crew refers to as the whiskey still, uh, is the, uh, is, uh, from Apollo 16. We don't, we have not identified which, uh, exact engine it's from. Um, we've got these kind of plex inserts, here, uh, which are placeholders for these parts here. So this is uh, is one of the, the two-stage turbines gas generator. And it's one of my absolute favorite artifacts. And I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think, you know, we can't get any closer. Uh, if you come to the museum, example of just the power of nature. Because if you think about it, these engines were designed to handle a million and a half pounds uh, for two minutes, getting us all the way to the edge of space. And then they fall back and, and crash into the ocean. And then it was the, the slow... Uh, erosion of salt water that finally produced like uh, a lot of the the degradation that we see. You know, there are definitely some dents and some cracks, but when you look at these up close, all the bolts that you see sticking up here, uh, the turbine, uh, have basically been hollowed out by corrosive uh, 
by uh, various types. Um, our injector plate, by contrast, is almost pristine. And, and one of the reasons for that is it was still uh, housed inside the lock stone, which was attached uh, to the thrust chamber housing uh, when it was found. And so it, it is in incredibly good shape. And we use this injector to tell the story of uh, solving the problem of combustion instability. And the way um, it's been described to me uh, is combustion instability, when they started testing these engines, they kept blowing them up. And it's basically like the, the, the story of the, the opera singer and the wine glass. It's, you know, when you hit that certain resonant frequency, the sound waves start bouncing around inside there and just blow. It's just instead of, you know, a singer, you've got this incredibly forceful, loud engine and a lot of uh, uh, Inconel and other uh, other newly developed <laughs> aerospace metals. Um, and ultimately, the way they ended up solving the, the instability problem was with this intricate series of baffles that you see on the face of the injector, which helped to dampen uh, those those sound waves and get the engine acting like an engine. So it's really cool to be able to have it uh, out here uh, uh, and talk about that story, which we uh, we talk about the the combustion instability problem uh, in the in the ID panel there. So these engines were found uh, about fourteen thousand five hundred feet below the surface of the ocean. So to put that in perspective, that's about half a kilometer deeper than the Titanic. And if you think about what the Titanic is in terms of a target that you need to, to locate, it's a giant piece of metal. Here you're dealing with a size of an SUV. So it's it was an incredible feat that they were able to actually locate and then get down there to recover them. And they brought up uh, several com components from several of the engines. Um, we 12, some from Apollo 16. Uh, they also brought up uh, components from Apollo, which went to the National Air and Space Museum, as well as uh, some from, uh, I believe, Apollo 13 and, and 4. Another interesting story is how they actually managed to identify some of these engines, because they were having a heck of a time finding any and worn away. And there was a guy who, so the engines, when they came up, uh, they were treated on the ship. And then they were brought and made their way to the Cosmosphere outside Hutchison, Kansas. And if you haven't been there, it's an incredible tiny town in Kansas that has an awesome collection. And they also have uh, one of the restoration shops for space anywhere. Like, they are the go-to place. We've used them uh, for a number of different uh, projects with the Museum of Flight. Uh, they're the go-to go place for... Uh, conserving and restoring spacecraft. Uh, they they did Grissom's Mercury capsule, uh, and then they they also did uh, uh, the conservation work on the F1 engine. And Jared Alexander was one of the, the cons conservators who had a background working as a mechanic, and he remembered that they would use black light to find oil leaks uh, working as a car mechanic, and he thought. Okay, 1960s are probably still using organic paints on to mark the engines. And so he went and grabbed a blacklight from an auto shop and scanned the engine and sure enough found the the residual remnants of some of the uh, the registration to then use use those markings to identify which components came from which engine. And they had Based on uh, you know where they were finding them in the debris field and 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 uh, mapping that to to each mission, that proof didn't come until uh, they made that breakthrough to scan with ultraviolet light. So let's see, another uh, 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 on the the Apollo twelve uh, mission, uh, we've got a, a number of items uh, from that mission. Uh, here's, you know, small uh, effects and the like. Uh, and the Apollo 12 mission is, is really a fascinating mission because the the crews didn't always necessarily uh, get along together, but Apollo 12 was very different. Like, it was uh, Pete Conrad, Al Bean, and um, Dick Gordon were all best friends. Uh, Conrad and, and Gordon had been shipmates 
and uh, Conrad had been Bean's instructor at Pat, at Pax River. So they got along so ridiculously well. And, and, and so basically the Apollo 12 mission was like going on the ultimate road trip with your two best friends. Uh, and, you know, th there's stories about them just like, like dancing in the command module on their way uh, out to the moon. Uh, Al Bean. So uh, apparently Sugar Sugar was on, on heavy rotation in the command module. Um, and, but uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's really cool to, to talk about that mission uh, at mission rather than, you know, we definitely cover Apollo 11, but everything after that often gets overshadowed by moon landing. And Apollo also a very important first because it was the first precision landing. So 11, I think, ended up touching down uh, like six miles from its originally intended uh, landing site uh, because they were coming down a, a boulder field. Um, Apollo 12, they, they picked a target, the, the lunar um, uh, surveyor uh, spacecraft, which had been landed uh, several years before to, to test the properties of the, the lunar surface. And they landed uh, about a football field away from, uh, from that, uh, that lander. Uh, and another, so Apollo 12, in addition to uh, to having this achievement of, of being the, the first precision landing on the moon, also had a lot of uh, pranks and, and other uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, uh, silliness that went along with. And one of the more infamous ones is around the cuff checklist that the, the two moonwalkers wore. So there was a guy, this was not the only mission to have uh, pranks played on the prime crew. Often the backup crew. Uh, so there was another mission where the backup crew uh, hid mission patches with the backup crew's names. All, you know, all storage uh, things, uh, and a lot of these uh, a lot of these shenanigans were orchestrated by a guy named Raúl Ernie Reyes, who was part of the the ground crew that that basically prepped uh, the the command module for. Uh, for launch. And one of the things he would do is draw uh, Snoopy cartoons in the checklists of the uh, of the, the Moonwalkers. And, and he would, uh, you know, kind of draw these amusing uh, cartoons of Snoopy walking on the moon with, with, with various captions. Of course, uh, NASA and, and Snoopy had a very um, developed a, a very uh, uh, good relationship during the Apollo program when Snoopy became NASA's official uh, safety mascot. And uh, in addition to those, on Apollo 12, in addition to the Snoopy cartoons, uh, the, they also inserted uh, photocopies of, uh, taken out of a Playboy magazine into, interleaved into the actual checklist of Pete Conrad and Al Bean uh, with um, sort of official sounding captions you know, asking them to admire the hills and valleys and those sorts of things. And this is Pete Conrad's cuff checklist from Apollo 12. And I can confirm, having having uh, helped get the artifact prepped for exhibit, that those photocopies are still included in there. And some of the interesting things that I discovered while working on this exhibit is, uh, is, is they, they live on in very... Uh, understated ways through, uh, after the Apollo program, Al Bean became an artist and he was a painter. And he has a painting called My Friend Pete that has, uh, there's, it's taken from an actual official NASA photo of Pete standing on the surface of the moon. And in the photo, you, it's really difficult to see, but he's got his che his checklist open to one of those pages. But with the the lighting and such, it's, it's, it's really, uh, uh, blown out. Um, and so unless you have seen the actual page, you wouldn't recognize that this is uh, not a public affairs friendly photo uh, <laughs> on it. Uh, but Al Bean did a painting of that that photo. And of course, in his description of the painting, he does not mention uh, the, the story or the content of the checklist uh, at all. But uh, that was one of, of, of several interesting uh, uh, pranks, both to, to come from the support crew, but also the, the Apollo 12 crew had other really interesting ideas, one of the, which was they wanted to have giant baseball caps that they could put on 
over their uh, their uh, helmets while they were on the moon, and they actually got them uh, built, though they did not get them cleared to to fly. So there are some giant Apollo 12 baseball caps still circulating out uh, in museums or, or collecting circles somewhere. Uh, and if you uh, come across any of them, Nancy Conrad, Pete's uh, widow, would very much like to know uh, where they are. So uh, another thing that, uh, another uh, story I'd like to, to talk about. So those, those first moon landings, obviously they landed, the astronauts didn't go particularly far from the landing site. So to explore farther, now that they've proven that we can land in a, precisely on the moon, uh, the last three Apollo missions, 15, 16, and 17, wanted to be able to explore around the more geologically interesting terrain where they were able to land. And so they built um, these rovers. Now, these rovers were actually also built by Boeing. It was a, a, a partnership between NASA Marshall's Space Flight Center, uh, GM, and Boeing uh, that, that designed the rover. And then final assembly actually uh, happened at Boeing at the Kent Space Center, which is where the, the lunar orbiter story uh, took place earlier in this tour. So these were built here in Washington. Um, this is an, an engineering model from Boeing of the, the lunar rover. Uh, and these extended the, the astronauts range out to six miles from the, uh, from the LEM. And the reason for that limitation was not uh, due to the, the limitations of the rover. It was how far they estimated the astronauts could safely walk back in the event that the rover crashed or broke down or the like. So, uh, and I realize I've been chatting, chatting, chatting and uh, wondering if, if, if folks have any any questions, uh, feel free to, to chime in. Um, and, I'll, and I'm happy to hop back to other locations as well, if you like. Uh, so when, when this uh, exhibit opened uh, shortly after we, we were approached by the city of Kent, Washington, where the Boeing Space Center was located. And they were looking to landmark the lunar rovers on the moon. And the museum worked with them and worked with the, the King County uh, Landmarking Commission. And the, the in 2019, uh, for the, the 50th anniversary of the, the first moon landing, we managed to get the rovers designated as county landmarks. Um, there are three of them still on the moon. And then uh, we were beginning to, to line up to assist with the, uh, the state landmarking effort when uh, the pandemic hit. And, but it sounds like the, the city of Kent continued to work behind the scenes and they ended up uh, uh, achieving state landmark status uh, I believe uh, early last year. So, uh, so there are officially three Washington state landmarks uh, on the surface of the moon. And right now it's, it's largely a, a symbolic um, gesture, but as we start looking and more people and not just the U S government, but, uh, but more, um, uh, you know, private efforts and things start to look at the uh, returning to the moon. There's a lot of discussion about how do we protect the assets from the Apollo program, because there's not a lot of regulation uh, in lunar space beyond the Outer Space Treaty, which is is you know from the you know from what is it 67, uh, and is is uh, uh, very general. And so there's a, a lot of discussion happening now within uh, museums and other folks in the historical community about you know what do we need to do to make sure that these things are protected and uh, that landmarking status in some ways helps to give us at least some leg to stand on based on uh, cultural preservation uh, rules uh, in the event that if some other uh, country or organization landed near one of the rovers and decided to take a sample for study, uh, we would at least have somewhat of a leg to stand on. So uh, someone's asking what the, the wraps are on the wheels of the rover. Um, so uh, are you, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. We can zoom in here. Uh, so the rovers, the wheels are interesting because they're mesh. Um, they are, uh, they're not tires. Uh, they're basically piano wire. Uh, and so they've, they've got um, the, the, the gold here is, is, those are the, you know, fenders. And then they're, they're piano wires with this, with uh, sort of an internal, 
ring of uh, more sturdy uh, metal that to help support them. Uh, and then these these metal plates kind of bolted on to provide traction. So some of the advantages of doing these mesh wheels, uh, they're much lighter than rubber tires. And also you don't have to deal with um, pressure fluctuations from going on, because these rode on the side of the, the limb. And, uh, and so you didn't have to deal with regulating tire pressure all the way from one atmosphere at the beginning of launch to the vacuum of space and then obviously still in the vacuum of space after after landing. Um, so th the the design of the wheels was was one of the the big innovations uh, in in the the lunar rover and, and hopefully hopefully that answered your question. So Jeff, I just want to break in to say if you need more time, you can go ahead and go till a uh, quarter past the hour. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the the we're we're really proud to to be able to kind of tell that local story uh, around the rovers, and uh, we're getting fairly close to the end of the exhibit. I want to just share a couple other uh, uh, stories of of really uh, key artifacts that we have in the exhibit. Um, one of the, the things we have is a small collection of, of materials related to Deke Slayton, who was one of the, the Mercury 7 astronauts who was famously grounded after uh, he developed atrial fib fibrillation, or, or a heart murmur, essentially. Uh, and uh, despite having uh, aced all the, the testing as a Mercury astronaut, he was grounded from flying. And rather than... Uh, rather than uh, 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 basically just kind of boot him from the program, NASA decided to make him head of the astronaut office. And so Deke was in charge of assigning all of the crews uh, during the, the early space program. He picked who, who was flying. And uh, one of the things that we have, and I don't know if we're going to be able to get a good close-up. So, Pat, you were asking about the uh, the... Um, the rover, I, uh, I, I'm guessing you're asking about the rover. I'm getting kind of a delay between when I'm seeing questions and, and when uh, we're chatting. I believe that's an engineering, uh, full-scale engineering uh, uh, model. Um, so I don't think it was a flight spare. Um, let's see. Yeah, so unfortunately, I can't quite, it's, it's incredibly tiny, but in this little display case here, so one of the things about Deke is that since he was went through the Mercury astronaut training like all the, the, the other guys and, and came from the, that same test pilot culture, they all really respected him and they, they thought of him as one of their own. And when he picked the crew for Apollo 1, uh, the crew was so honored at having been selected for that mission, they wanted to... Uh, do something to recognize that respect for Deke. And so when astronauts fly, they get this gold pin and they decided to get to commission a pin for Deke. And they, but knowing that he would never agree to wear a pin that was exactly the same as one that an astronaut who had flown wore, they modified it by adding a little diamond in, into the star at the top of the pin. And, uh, they were going to present it to him after the Apollo 1 mission. Well, of course, the fire happened, the crew was killed, and a couple weeks after the accident, their their widows called Deke over to one of their houses, and he's thinking, you know, why do they want to talk to me at a time like this? And he gets there, and uh, the, the wives, you know, tell him, they say, you know, our husbands had... Had made so had gotten something for you, and they wanted you to have this, as a, you know, to to show, you know, how much they appreciated being selected for that mission, and they presented Deke with this pin, and he was so touched and so moved by by this uh, by by this occurrence that he that pin stayed with him and went from lapel to lapel. Oh, uh, Pat, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, in case you don't see it, there is an image of the pin uh, posted in chat. So that pin went uh, from lapel to lapel uh, 
uh, for Deke throughout his career. And the only time it was out of his possession was when it went on Neil Armstrong's uh, PPK, his personal preference kit, to the moon. Uh, and uh, several years ago, uh, we worked with uh, Armstrong uh, prior to his passing and, and some of the, the other folks at NASA. And the Museum of Flight has uh, Deke's pin on display and the full story of it uh, displayed um, down below. So, um, yeah, and, and Deke was, he's a, a fascinating guy because, like, you know, he, he, if you hear him talk, he just, he, like, he sounded like he came off a ranch. He was just very soft-spoken, southern drawl, a little bit mumbly, um, but was was really just a kind of an anchor point for the whole uh, early uh, astronaut program. And Deke did get to fly on the Apollo Soyuz test project. And some of the other um, items we have from his collection, we have uh, 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 his one of his flight jackets. And then we also have a whole big set of his day planners. And we have this one day planner on display and it is from the, the day that he was cleared to fly. And it just has this, and you can just, if your screen is big enough, you should be able to read it. That last line there, it says he was cleared for flying at 1315. And he just, you know, just underlined, you know, that's it. Not a lot of, not a lot of word, but uh, yeah, when, when they finally uh, restored his flight status, a uh, report is he just immediately uh, dashed out the door and jumped into the cockpit. Um, but we, yeah, we've got a whole selection of his, these daily planners that, that he used. And, and he went on uh, after the Apollo program to, uh, uh, to really attempt some early efforts in terms of uh, commercializing space uh, through the, the Conestoga uh, program, which was uh, an effort to purchase uh, surplus uh, rockets to, to launch uh, basically early, you know, the, the idea was space tourism flights. Uh, we, another thing that we have of Deeks is uh, some audio, audio cassette oral histories of him talking about things like uh, his and hers Neiman Marcus space flights that you could buy for Christmas, <laughs> you know, back in, in the, the early to mid 1980s. So, and we're only just now uh, seeing some of those dreams come into fruition. So uh, here real quick, I just want to point out one other um, little uh, uh, highlight of the shenanigans of Apollo 12. So after the, the mission, when they were in quarantine, uh, when they get on the, the ship, the, the crew get their, their caps, and this is Pete Conrad's cap. And uh, he added, you can see it here, he added a propeller beanie uh, to the top of his hat. And so if you see the photo of the Apollo 12 crew, it's hard to, to notice it without, um, if, you don't, if you don't know what you're looking for. But when you look at this crew, it's got, or in, you can find it on like JPL's Flickr for, uh, they, they sort all their, um, all the mission photos by mission and, and chronologically. So if you go to the Apollo 12 mission, uh, you can just make out the beanie on top of uh, Conrad's hat. And if you didn't know it was there, you would never, uh, never notice it. But um, yeah, so that's that's one of the reasons why we're really excited to to have Conrad and, and Apollo 12 in particular is kind of a, a through line of uh, of our particular exhibit. Um, but as we kind of make our way out of here, where we talk about Apollo 11, <clears throat> we've got another really, you know, one of these incredible tiny artifacts that uh, can be easy to overlook. So in this case right here, we have a small piece of wood and a small swatch of fabric that came from the original 1903 Wright Flyer. And they were carried in Neil Armstrong's personal preference kit to the moon. So these uh, these pieces of the Wright brothers' first airplane uh, went to the the moon and back. And the the story is that on that very first day of flight, uh, the they made four flights, and then uh, they were taking a break, and a gust of wind came along and blew the plane over and damaged the upper wing. And so they took it back to their workshop, and they cut away the damaged uh, material and made repairs. But they hung on to the the material, and uh, in the 1960s, the the Wright family reached out 
to the Air Force Museum to broker a deal with Neil, Neil Armstrong that to, to carry some of these pieces that were left over from that first day of flight uh, to the moon and back. And the agreement they came to was that if Armstrong would agree to bring these items, uh, he could keep half of them. And so the Armstrong family, uh, after that, has been distributing these mostly on loan to museums and other educational institutions uh, to connect the um, the the that first day of flight with the the incredible achievement of the the moon landing. And these uh, were actually donated. They are they are uh, by the Armstrong family to the Museum of Flight. So these are actually uh, part of the Museum of Flight's uh, permanent collection, and it's just this incredible. Uh, uh, poetic uh, uh, moment. Let's see. Um, uh, so George, great question. And I think we're, we're getting close to the end of the exhibit. We're going to go a little bit over, but I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the Stein collection at the, the conclusion of the, the tour. The short answer is yes. And I will um, uh, talk a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. So, uh, so I'm, I, and I, I apologize for kind of hopping around here since we're all big space buffs. I'm not really telling the the full tour story. I'm kind of diving into to some of the 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 America behind the specific artifacts that we have because we've got some really cool stuff that we don't get a chance to to talk about when we just have to to cover. Okay, this is what happened first. This is what happened second. So. Um, I just want to back up here real quick and talk about this LEM ascent stage. So, and one aspect of it in particular. So again, this was this was a, a, an art piece originally that was built um, as a, a, a project and uh, very high fidelity. However, one of the things that I've learned is that is not exactly accurate are the lights. And the reason I know that is because the guy who designed the light, the running lights for the LEM, and as well as numerous other spacecraft from Gemini up through through shuttle, uh, came through the museum and took a look at them and said, "Well, those those aren't quite right." He's a guy by the name of Gordon Lavering, and he worked for a company called IMAC, not related to Apple. Uh, started with an E, E I M A C, and they did a lot of the the lighting and electronic components on Apollo, and Gordon built. The lights and after he came through uh he met with with some of our team and brought us some samples of the the lights that he uh that he had that he's just kind of had in his uh closet uh at his house uh you know since the apollo program so and these are these are kind of fascinating and we've got them displayed here uh in in order uh, so this this first light over here on the the far left is actually from the the Agena target vehicle used during the the Gemini program, and then he's got uh, command module and lunar module lights uh, here in the middle, and then this one on the far right is from the shuttle MMU, and he talked about some of the considerations that they had to go through when designing lights for space because the the lights for the command module, for example. Uh, the ones on the outside were in the stream of the rocket during launch, so they they were exposed to a tremendous amount of heat as the the rocket was was going up, and and so uh, among other things, he designed the the lights with a quartz rather than a glass dome over the top, and then there are, there are several small individual uh, bulbs, and and the 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 lights they designed also you know they didn't have LEDs at the time. Uh, they, they were all designed with tungsten filaments. And one of the things that they also had to contend with was vibration. And they did the, the lights ha had this clear dome over the top, and then each individual bulb, there's like five or six in there, um, have a, a colored plastic uh, cap over them that actually gives them the, the color when they're, they're lit. But he, what he did not want was one of those, one of those covers to pop off and, and allow uh, electricity to arc between uh, between the, the individual bulb elements because uh, that could cause a, a very bad day. And so he was actually inspired by 
his son's cap gun. He saw his son had the you know the the the, the red ring of, of of caps, and so he designed the lights. He took the um, uh, inspiration from that cap ring design to insert from the back, so they were sandwiched into uh, the housing, so that no matter how much they shook, uh, they would not pop out. Now, all that being being said, they they still had some concern around vibration, and the uh, that concern actually uh, adjusted, it caused NASA to adjust the the launch profile of the lunar module from the lunar surface uh, in order to take into account uh, the performance of the running lights and and not cause uh, any kind of of uh, damage to the vehicle. Uh, during launch. And, that, and one of the things that he talks about, uh, we did an oral history with him, was, uh, uh, com- was, was coming up with a, and adjusting that launch profile in order to, to avoid any potential risk uh, from, from the lights or, or to, the, to damaging the lights so that they could operate once they, they got into space. So a couple other other uh, things that we have here, and we're just about we've kind of gotten through the core Apollo story. We also cover the 1970s. Uh, one of the really cool objects that we have on display is uh, this is actually the flight spare for the Viking lander. This is uh, the Viking lander three. Uh, it is it is on loan uh, from the the family of uh, Jim Tillman, who is a, a professor at the University of Washington, who um, who. Uh, covered the the uh, he he was an atmospheric scientist and so he developed uh, this this atmospheric uh, probe to to record the weather on um and then some of the other uh really uh, kind of cool stuff we have some items from um let's see right now we've got Apollo Soyuz on display or no, yeah so we've got Vance Brand's um uh, flight jacket from Apollo Soyuz uh, and then we have a, uh, some ephemera from Skylab, from and in particular from Pete Conrad's flight. And one of the things, one of the cool stories, the last story I'll I'll tell uh, before we we end the tour portion, and then we'll talk a little more about the Stein collection, uh, is this cassette tape here. So this cassette was carried by Conrad uh, to the moon on Skylab One or Skylab Two, I guess, um, first mission to Skylab. Um, and we've had it in our collection for like 20 years and we'd never played it. And it's just this cheap glued together cassette tape. And it's on the outside, it's got uh, artist names written on it. And it's, it's a lot of um, uh, country music greats from the, from the 1970s, Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn, uh, folks like that. But there's no track listings. And we were curious to find out what is on this tape. And it's actually on loan from Nancy Conrad, uh, Pete's widow. And so in the run-up to this exhibit, we reached out to Nancy and said, hey, we'd like to, uh, we'd, we'd really like uh, to find out what's on that tape. Can we take it to an audio archivist to see if we can play it and record what and digitize it? And she gave us permission. Um, but then when uh, we took it to the archivist, they, they started playing it hear a couple seconds of Loretta Lynn's voice and what sounds like a, a personal message to the Skylab astronauts. And then the, the tape breaks. And we're horrified. And we go back to Nancy and we say, okay, the tape broke. We're incredibly sorry. Uh, we think we can salvage it. We want to take it to a different audio archivist, but we may need, in- we may need to crack into that. She says, well, the, 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 the music that's on that tape is what's really important. So we go to this other audio archivist, and he actually managed. He, what he discovers is that it, the tape didn't actually break. It the adhesive that attached it to the reel had just failed, and so he actually managed to to add some new adhesive and, and reattach it without having to to crack into the cons- cassette. And we got it digitized. And what we found is it was a private record. It wasn't just a mixtape. It was a private recording session by Nashville's greats from the 1970s for the and and so what we did is in in this when you come to the museum this kiosk is is active now when we took this scan we had all our all of our uh, touch interactives uh, covered uh, because of the pandemic uh, this kiosk has 
uh, all of the interstitial banter. Like if you listen to the old country music shows, uh, you know, the, 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 the jibber jabber between songs, all that interstitial banter and all the messages uh, to the Skylab astronauts uh, playable as, as uh, 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 kind of a, a touchscreen uh, selector. Uh, we are hoping to be able to get a um, to work with a, a company here in Seattle that specializes in uh, in getting rights to to recreate uh, old uh, records and to potentially release a, a vinyl pressing of the Skylab mixtape uh, at some point, hopefully for the the anniversary uh, next year. But that's that's really my last stop on the tour. Does anyone uh, before we uh, hop over into chat? It's been been going through this for about two hours so before we hop over to to uh, to say a couple things about um the stein collection does anyone have any any questions related to the tour i'll just pause for a little bit all right so i'm gonna stop sharing this screen um and so the so really good question okay so let's see so uh so uh arian uh asks uh, if there is a link to to listen to the music tape recording i don't believe we have uh an online version of that yet i can ask uh the i can ask our exhibit team uh member who who did the digitization to, to see if if there is a a publicly available version. A few of us have uh, privately the the full uh, recording, but uh, we do not have the rights to to share it. Um, but uh, I can I can check on the that the the interstitial banter uh, version of it, which should be uh, publicly available. We're, we're playing it. We've been playing it in the gallery for you know several uh, several years. So. Um, Okay, so the Stein collection. Let me pull the so great question from George about um, about how to get access to the Stein and Estes collection. So the Estes collection, we have not finished processing. We're we're going through them um, kind of in order that we were uh, components. So um, I'm going to share my screen again here. So if you go to uh, archives.museumoflight.org and or just do a, a search for G. Harry Stein Museum of Flight, uh, you should see a listing for this page. This is the this is our official page for the collection. Uh, and it, it includes uh, we have just recently uh, updated and, and done a much more in-depth uh, finding aid for the collection. And so it covers uh, uh, some of the background. It covers uh information on all of the, the different uh, kind of categories of material that are in the collection. It is, uh, I believe, available for researchers uh, now. So our, our archive is um, open by appointment only. Uh, we are a closed stack. So the way it works is you would come into our research center and you would, uh, you would have been communicating with our archivists ahead of time to let them know uh, what you wanted them to pull, and then they will have it pulled for you, and then you can, you can uh, review uh, the material. Um, so we have a lot of folks use our archive for research for everything from student projects all the way um, up through uh, authors writing books and the like. And the, the Stein Collection has some really in incredible stuff. And as I mentioned very early on in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, presentation, we just uh, last year received an addendum to it, uh, which included a lot of uh, stuff related to his science fiction work, his uh, his work at White Sands, and and a lot of the the, the sort of uh, surrounding context uh, beyond his his model rocketry work, um, and and so it's an incredible collection. Uh, uh, we are incredibly grateful. Uh, to the National Association of Rocketry for helping provide the funding uh, to get this collection processed. It's it's because of the the work that uh, that you guys uh, 
you know, helped to, to fund that we were able to get a specific dedicated archivist uh, to, to work on this collection over the last couple of years. Um, oh, uh, I have not heard whether or not the closing statement is, is. The closing statements are delayed to the end of your presentation and then okay. we'll jump over to the, to that. Okay, excellent. So the closing statement has been delayed. I will not keep you guys uh, too much longer. So, if, uh, and uh, the other question related to uh, to the the Stein collection, Scott asks um, about some uh, collectible rocket motors uh, from Gary Rosenfeld. Uh, so, anything in our collection is um, is potentially available to researchers by appointment. So. Uh, if it is on display, it is publicly viewable. And if it is in our uh, re in our collection, if, if you are conducting research or the, or the like, it is um, it is available uh, by appointment through our through the Dahlberg Research Center. Is uh, um, so if, if you come in to um, to archives, you can uh, you can submit research requests here for you know uh, asking about. Uh, uh, you know, kind of details about the collection. You can also email curator at museumoflight.org uh, if you uh, want to try to be routed uh, to, to set up an appointment um, uh, uh, to come and, and view anything at the in the collection. So let's see. And Pat asking about uh, uploading the PDF do not know about that. Um, I would have to ask uh, our, our archives team about how they they feel about uh, about uh, about that. I think a direct link would probably be shareable, but actually transferring the the, the file, it has. I'd have to ask uh, uh, whether or not they um, uh, they'd be open to that. Because ultimately, I'm kind of like a researcher. I'm I'm as the curator. I'm really the the end user of all of this, the, the hard work that our collections team uh, goes through. You know, they, they will ask me if they have questions about space related stuff, but they are the, the experts on the organization and, uh, and the, and structuring this so that it is a useful, um, uh, uh, so that it, it's a useful tool for anyone who wants to use it. Um, and Pat, thank you. Uh, Pat mentions that NAR members do get a 10% discount. So uh, we do charge for things like uh, photo use, uh, photo licensing for things like books, um, and uh, and and there there are a number of, I believe, coming into the research center to view things, it, there is no charge, but um, but uh, there are certain other sort of uh, ancillary activities that that might um, uh, come with with a fee uh, that helps cover the uh, time in in assisting. Um, and uh, Cliff, you ask, uh, what is what exactly is on public display? So um, one of the, the the really awesome things about this collection is it's it's so versatile. We have been pulling we pull bits from it for all sorts of exhibits. So we, I, I called out a couple of the the elements that were on display uh, in the Apollo Gallery. Um, in our other space gallery, that is where we have our dedicated model rocketry exhibit, uh, Inspiring Rockets, which we. Uh, we worked with uh, with Pat and Trip Barber and a number of the other uh, NAR principals uh, back in I think 2015 or put together a uh, a display on the on the hobby of of model rocketry, not just the early days, but uh, so that includes uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of both uh, historic uh, pieces as well as. Um, uh, uh, more contemporary uh, items, which so um, I think we've we've got uh, one of Guppy Youngren's uh, boost gliders. We've got um, uh, Alyssa Stenberg's uh, boost glider. Uh, so we've got a whole case on on competition rockets. Uh, we've got Cinerox, Camrox, uh, 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 rocket shoot motors. Uh, we've got the I can't remember the name of it, but the the old sort of wooden triangle. Uh, sextant that was used for for calculating altitude. Um, we've got um, a rocket that uh, astronaut Jay Apt flew uh, that was built by Vern. 
uh, Estes and that JF took up on shuttle with him. So we've got a much bigger um, model rocketry display in uh, our space shuttle gallery. And um, and that one also includes a, a big art uh, exhibit that the NAR uh, contributed to. We created this, um, what we were we were called referred to as the fusillade of rockets. It's a, a whole sort of art piece in the corner front corner of the gallery of a, a bunch of model rockets kind of going up in a in a big uh, spray on on wires. And that uh, originated as a, a contest within a, a build contest within the NAR, I believe. So, but uh, we also pull from uh, from the collection a lot for exhibits. Uh, I know I used uh, some photos and um, so, and at least one model uh, in our uh, exhibit on aerospace medicine, which is actually uh, going to close here in about a week. It was our temporary exhibit all of last year. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a fantastic collection, not just for model rocketry content, but also for a lot of uh, material related to uh, to space history, and so we draw from it quite a bit. So, all right. Um, so I think I am holding up uh, the conclusion of of the uh, of Narcon, uh, and so if there are no for, uh, further burning, um, I will hand it off to uh, uh, back to Todd and to the the organizers to to close this thing out. Thank you all so much for letting me be a part of it and for letting me ramble on at you for a couple of hours. I hope you enjoyed the tour and hopefully uh, the bandwidth issues weren't, weren't too distracting. Jeff, thank you so much. If everybody would just head over to the, uh, the last session of virtual Narcon, uh, it's the closing statements. Uh, we'll uh, get that started in just a minute or two. And thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Todd. And uh, thank you all for, for joining me.